When the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman who brought forth the man-child. And there were given to the woman two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the desert unto her place, unto her place, where she is nourished from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth after the woman water as it were a river that he might cause her to be carried away by the river. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the river, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Chapter 12, the Apocalypse. Okay, notice the word place. That she might fly unto the desert, unto her place. Let's underline that word, place. Very important word. This passage from the Apocalypse is key is key, of in key importance in a time like our own when the devil is spewing forth a river of lies and revolution. It's flooding the world around us. Perhaps we can make King David's words in the Psalms our own. Save me, O God, for the waters are come in even unto my soul. Psalm 68. Yet, if we abide in our place, given to us by God, then even the very earth will come to our rescue and dry up this flood. We have it from the Scriptures. So are we in our place? Do we stay in our place when we know it? Humility can be simply defined as knowing your place and taking your place. Knowing your place and taking your place. What's the key element of being a Catholic? Being humble. That's the best virtue to have because all other virtues will flow from humility. So when you're humble, everything's possible. What's humility again? Knowing your place and taking your place. Don't we have a saying, I was in the right place at the right time. That is what I want for you. To be in your place at the right time according to God's plan. Then no matter how strong the flood waters of the devil may be, no matter how high they rise, you will be able to endure the flood. Your soul will be safe. The earth will come to your rescue even. As the apocalypse indicates, the devil longs to displace us to get us to come out of our place. When our Lord was on the cross, the last temptation the devil flung at Him was what? Come down. Come down from that cross. Save yourself and save us. Isn't that the last temptation of Christ? Come down. That's not your place. Homeschooling is your place. Homeschooling is your place. Homeschooling is your cross. Don't come down. Don't leave your place. Souls will be saved. The pressure to come down, it's incredible, isn't it? Pressures from relatives, lack of success, lack of talent, liberation of women, especially of mothers, government influence. It's promoted by the world all around us, these sorts of things. But now let's listen to the Holy Father, Pope Pius XI, describe how many of these errors flow from communism. He wrote about this in the 1930s. And he specifically mentions Russia of all places. This is coming from Russia, ultimately, he said. Here's what he said. Communism is particularly characterized by the reaction of any link that binds woman to the family and the home. Okay, again, communism is particularly characterized by the rejection of any link that binds woman to the family and the home. And her emancipation is proclaimed as a basic principle. She is withdrawn from the family and the care of her children to be thrust into public life and collective production under the same conditions as man. The care of the home and children then devolves upon the collectivity. 
Pope Pius XI, this has come true in our day. Communism is reigning. Maybe we don't call it that, but the mentality is here. We've heard the slogan said over and over again, ad nauseum at certain times, it takes a village, it takes a village, it takes a village. That's communism. Communism also takes away parents' rights to raise and educate children. Listen to Pope Pius XI. Finally, the right of education is denied to parents, for it is conceived as the exclusive prerogative of the community, in whose name and by whose mandate alone parents must exercise this right. In other words, only the community, school system, they're the only ones qualified to educate. Pope Pius XI made it clear their intention was to uproot the Catholic faith in the family and in the children. He also made it clear that these errors were emanating from Moscow. Imagine that. Our Lady warned us at Fatima that Russia would spread her errors, and Russia has successfully done this. It's not over yet. Homeschooling is one of our responses to preserve all things Catholic. This is our cross. Let us not come down from such a privileged place. Yes, it's hard, but it's a privileged place. And when you're privileged, it's going to be hard. You're going to wear that crown? You've got to deserve it. What a great service you are doing for the church at this time by persevering in this place. Now, the Catholic Church has been persecuted before, and we know that. As we know, she was openly attacked and suppressed in the first centuries of our Lord. This made for fervent Christians and martyrs. They also fought back by going what? To the catacombs. They had to go underground. Homeschooling is a catacomb. When, however, Constantine Constantine legalized Christianity, laxity soon prevailed. So when it was legalized, laxity became normal. This led many saintly souls to go out into the desert to preserve their faith. Homeschooling is among the new deserts for saintly souls. The holy men, the many holy men, often called desert fathers like St. Anthony the Great, they went out into the dry and arid regions of Egypt and dwelt in caves to pray and study and labor to conquer completely the world, the flesh and the devil that was in them and around them. If you read their lives and ponder their sayings, a repeated theme is this. I mean, it's in all their writings. Don't leave your cave. Don't leave your cave. Don't leave your cave. (laughs) Even if you're forced to sleep all day, don't leave your cave. That's what they said. For the devil, the devil was very crafty in tempting the men to come out of their caves, doing all kinds of tricks. I'm hurt out here. My ankle's broken. Father, come help me. They wouldn't leave their cave because they knew it was the devil playing a trick on them. He did everything to get those monks to come out and ultimately to give up, to give in, come down, and come back to the world. In Dostoevsky's novel, The Brothers Karamazov, when the rationalistic, enlightened, and proud brother Ivan, representing modern man, encountered the devil, he asks about the desert fathers. He says, have you ever tempted the one who eats locusts, those ones, you know, those desert fathers, and pray for 17 years in the barren desert? The devil answered him, my dear, I've done nothing else. One forgets the whole world and all worlds and clings to such a one because a diamond like that is just too precious. One such soul is sometimes worth a whole constellation. We have our own arithmetic. It is a precious victory. I think that's very accurate of Dostoevsky. Think about it. Homeschooling is our cave, our desert, our cross. The devil is out to get all the faithful homeschoolers who are putting up a fight. Be warned. The devil wants to add to his victories by getting us to what? Come down and give up. Are we a constellation? What are we worth? A diamond is formed under high pressure. A lot of pressure's on you. Diamonds are being formed. 
Stars are being formed. And stars come out at night when it's dark. It's getting pretty dark. We need some stars to shine. Homeschooling is our cross, our desert, our catacomb, our cave. Are we keeping to our place? In the apocalypse, we heard about a flooding river that flows from the devil's mouth. In Noah's time, he built the ark to overcome the flood brought on by the sins of man. The ark took 100 years to build. Homeschooling is building the ark. A place from which good souls can overcome the flooding river of revolution. Are we living in times not unlike those that have preceded Noah's flood? Yes. If we look to the causes of that flood, we will learn how the story really began with the failure of the sons of Seth. An ancient tradition is found in this book called The Cave of Treasures. Fascinating book. It describes the generations of Seth, the third son of Adam, as living on a mountain that was just below paradise. It was the closest they could get to paradise, which had been closed off to them due to Adam's sin. And they buried Adam and all the successive generations of Adam by Seth on top of this mountain. They were instructed to do so by God. Moreover, according to the tradition, they found great peace and purity of heart on that mountain. For in that place, they spent much time in prayer, study, praising and glorifying God. They were known as the sons of God and were victorious. And they were virtuous. What is more, since they were so near to paradise, some could even hear the angels chanting and singing in heaven. The sons of Seth represent to us the faithful Catholics in the church militant, to whom heaven opens up at every Mass. If we have ears to hear, we could hear the angels chanting. Again, here we have an image of the homeschool living on the mountain, a place where God is present. A place where virtue is practiced more easily and purity of heart more readily maintained. Okay, acting prudently and thinking of the future, thinking of heaven and a holy death. Seth made all his children swear an oath to remain on the mountain, saying, I will make you take an oath and to swear by the holy blood of Abel that none of you will go down from this holy mountain to the children of Cain who are in the valley below. Cain the murderer. For ye know well the enmity which has existed between us and Cain from the day whereon he slew Abel. That's from the Book of Treasures, Cave of Treasures. Now this was repeated by each of the successive generations until Jared was ruling on the mountain. Now at the time of Jared, down in the valley, the children of Cain, inspired by demons, made certain musical instruments and entered into the instruments themselves. And they started to play all kinds of music that touched on man's soul. That's where it often starts, music. You know, it's interesting to note that when Moses was coming down the mountain, remember that, and they had the golden calf down there? What was the first thing the Bible says about that party that was going on down there? Moses heard what? Music. 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 It often starts with music. Some moms come in, my children are rebelling. I can't figure it out. Well, what are they listening to? Oh, they're listening to rebellious music. And it's hitting them low and it's causing them to rebel. Music is serious business. Very serious. Now, it happened that some of the sons of God, the children of Seth, heard this music up on the mountain. Led by curiosity. Hmm, what's going on down there? Many of them came down, out of their place. They were listening in the wrong direction. Instead of listening up, they are listening down. Now we know the rest of the story from Genesis chapter 6. They broke their vows. They fell in with the daughters of Cain and slew their souls by means of carnal vice. So the sons of God, the sons of Seth, came down the mountain and they fell in with the daughters of Cain. Now, tradition says, when they tried to go back up the mountain, they were unable to do so. Yikes. 
St. Ephraim explains that this falling away of the faithful, the sons of Seth, ultimately led every one of the children of Seth, the whole mountain, to come down to the valley. They all gave up. And they produced the nearly universal vice that preceded the days of the flood. Let's translate that. The faithful believers going secular, wedding the world, giving in, coming down is what led to the universal destruction of mankind, almost universal, save eight people that were in the ark. Is this not happening now? Does this not apply to our media-drenched times when Catholics coming down the mountain and going secular all around us? Through our baptism and its vows, we have made an oath with the blood of Christ that speaks more eloquently than that of Abel to remain on this mountain, no matter how attractive the noise down below may sound. And let's face it, you know this, it's nearly impossible to escape it. Rock and roll music, it's everywhere. TV, movies, internet, booming car stereos, iPads, iPhones, iPods, I, 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 me, me, me. That's why they put I in front of it. That's why it's there for, to get you to think about yourself, I iMac, iPod, iPhone. Me. I want to serve me. We have rejected the world by our baptismal vows. We've rejected the flesh and the devil that are reveling down in the valley of death and have resolved to take our place. We have resolved to take our place with God on His holy mountain. And the devil... He's a murderer from the beginning and he wants to murder our souls. To slay them with a sword of vice by enticing us to what? Come down, come down, come down, leave your cave, leave your place. How easy it is to look outside of homeschooling to see that other schools, public schools, private schools are doing a better job. How tempting to leave the cave. How tempting it is to adapt to the ways of the world. What's humility again? Knowing your place. Taking your place. What did Pope Pius XI said? It is the place of parents to educate and raise their children. God revealed to Moses, as we read in the book of Numbers, that if by some misadventure someone kills another man, he can flee to one of the six cities of refuge that belong to the Levites. So if you're real good at the scriptures, you'll know about these cities of refuge. Chapter 35 of Numbers. Now, if he did not flee to one of them, he would be killed. So if he accidentally killed someone by misadventure of some kind, he had to flee to the city of refuge to be safe. Now, once in the city... He was safe as long as the death was not premeditated or intentional or committed with enmity. Okay. But the man must remain in the city of refuge until the death of the high priest who was anointed with oil, the scriptures say. If he left before his time and was caught by the avenger of blood, he could be put to death. The avenger of blood. He's talking about angels there. But we may ask, how does this homicide refer to us? What are the cities of refuge to us? Well, first consider the homicide. The prophet Ezekiel says, The soul that sinneth, the same shall die. The soul that sinneth, the same shall die. St. James says, Sin, when it is completed, begets death. St. John says, there is a sin unto death. So spiritually speaking, mortal sin is the homicide mentioned by Moses. The man commits a sort of spiritual homicide when he slays his soul by sin, but not by set purpose. In other words, not out of suicide or despair. Because he who commits sin does not do so with the intention of killing his own soul. He's doing it for some purpose of pleasure, self-gratification. So the sinner rather seeks some sort of object in which he can find contentment and self-satisfaction. And from this flows death to the soul. 
Now, the sinner commits homicide inasmuch as he kills the life of grace in his own soul. This is mortal sin. St. Paul talks about it, Hebrews chapter 6, that we slay Christ in our soul by sin. We crucify our Lord. Because of this spiritual homicide, we cannot enter the holy city of Jerusalem, the, the murderer, that's heaven, but rather must flee to a city of refuge if he's going to live. Okay, many of the generations that grew out of the 60s and 70s and 80s fell in with the world, drank readily from the revolutionary waters, sinned only to wake up and realize that they were in danger of falling prey to the avenger of blood, the destroying angel. Thus they fled to the seventh city of refuge, which is the Catholic Church, they made refuge. They made up for their sins. And what do they want to do? Preserve their children from the same mistakes they made. This makes the city of refuge a symbol of homeschooling again. Why do a lot of people homeschool? Because I don't want what happened to me to happen to you. I know my parents wished they had homeschooled us, but they woke up after we graduated. All these images, the place in the desert, the catacombs, the cave, the mountain, the cities of refuge, all point to how God provides for us a place of refuge, a sort of umbrella of protection. If we humbly take our place by staying under the umbrella, we are safe. God will always provide the graces to keep us on the right track. If we go out from under the umbrella, we're in danger. We are open for attack from the destroying angel if we go out from under the umbrella. St. Padre Pio, he compared it to approaching a vicious dog that is on a big leash. If we come within the length of the leash, that big dog can get us, obviously. The same is true of those coming out from under the umbrella. The big dog is the devil. The devil, however, is more than just a vicious big dog on a leash. He is a cunning lawyer. In the book of Job, we read how the devil entered into a sort of divine courtroom where he was granted permission to do certain things. He cannot operate without permission. He has to have permission and he has to earn that permission. He has to have permission. He has to have a subpoena, whatever it is. Granted permission. So he cannot operate without God giving him permission. I'll give an example of this. Blessed Mary of Jesus crucified, Discalced Carmelite, blessed of the 19th century. She was possessed by the devil for 40 days, mysteriously. And when the exorcist was exorcising her, someone brought her habit up and they could see part of her leg. And the devil went berserk. Cover that leg! Cover that leg! I am not allowed to reveal any part of her flesh. She must be modest. He did not have that permission. He seeks this permission in a sort of courtroom where he argues for his case, presenting evidence of how we did this or that to come clear of the city of refuge. Based on this information, God oftentimes allows him to pursue us with temptations so that we will grow in the opposite virtue, make up for past sins, and be victorious over that infernal fiend. Crush him under our foot. That's why hell's down below. It's meant to be crushed underfoot. The devil is very legalistic. And this is why Blessed Mary of Jesus crucified said of him. That was the one that possessed for 40 days. She said, he is like the wind. He can get through the tiniest cracks. He is watching us and he's taking notes. He's looking for any act of ours that is not under God's umbrella. So homeschooling is concerted effort. It's our concerted effort to stay under the umbrella which is first and foremost our holy Catholic faith, which includes all of our duties of our state in life. If we remain under its protection, if we remain in our duties of our state in life, the devil can't get us. 
We're safe. The devil has to coax us from out under the umbrella to come down, to leave our cave, to come within his reach. Be aware that due to the explosion of sins at this time, he's been given a very long leash. A more tempting voice. Hard to resist. So what makes us want to come out from under the umbrella? Well, many things. But they can all be captured by one capital vice, a cedia. And that's not a city. It's not a county or a country or a planet. A cedia. It's a Greek word for a sloth. Sloth. This is a major vice for homeschooling. Now, acedia can be most simply defined as not doing what you're supposed to be doing when you're supposed to be doing it. Not doing what you're supposed to be doing when you're supposed to be doing it. Sloth, or a certain tedium of the soul, manifests itself in various ways. St. John Climacus says, It is a tedium of the soul, a slackness of the mind, a neglect of religious exercises, a hostility, an hostility to vows taken. Here we can think of our baptismal vows to remain in the church, on the mountain, and not come down. We become hostile to our vows. It is an approval of worldly things, St. John says. It is a voice claiming that God does not care about me so much or whether I homeschool. It distracts us in prayer that some job needs to be done and searches out any plausible excuse to drag us from prayer as though with some kind of a halter or bit. Haven't you ever had that? You're praying and all this thing. Oh, wait, yeah, oh, yeah. That's, that's a temptation. It has you peeping out the windows of the city of refuge into the world to see if you are needed or that there may be something else to do. It wants us to be busy, busy, busy. A workaholic is a slothful man. Why? Because he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing when he's supposed to be doing it. He's doing a whole bunch of stuff. He's doing all the wrong stuff. And therefore, he's slothful. Sloth is not just laying around like a couch potato. The curious are slothful people being led out from the umbrella of grace by a wandering mind, searching for something new. St. John Cassian describes it as a certain disgust of where one is dwelling at present. These are his words. The slothful make a great deal of far off and distant places, describing such places as more suited to progress and more conducive to salvation, and also depicting the fellowship of the brothers there as pleasant and of an utterly spiritual cast. Thereupon, he says that he cannot be saved if he remains in that place. Let me translate. I can't do it anymore. Send the children here or there. They are more talented there. They're better there. They'll get a better education over there. I'm failing. St. John Climacus says that this tedium has many mothers. Forgetfulness of the things of heaven. Too heavy a burden or troubles. Yes, many moms have too many burdens or troubles. And disobedience is another one. He says sloth has many children. They cannot sit still, but want to be changing from place to place. Disobedience to one's superior. Forgetfulness of the judgment to come. And sometimes abandonment of one's vocation. They leave the mountain and they leave their cave. They give up. And the devil always works with a situation in which he finds us. Thus, they will tempt us little by little to leave, to give up. Maybe not physically so much at first, as spiritually. Now, that's easy. One today is to think of the web. We can go all sorts of places on the web without going anywhere physically. We can leave our cave very easily by just getting on the web, seeing things that are forbidden. Or he just out of curiosity. That's to leave the city of refuge. Stay in your cave. 
humbly accept your place. There are special graces given for the duties there. If we do them and keep our focus upon them, the devil is routed. He cannot touch you. In a word, God gives us a place under his umbrella. Homeschooling is our little city of refuge, our cave, our mountain. If we abide in it, we can defeat the destroying angel. Asidia is the vice by which the devil works on us to leave that place. Man gets bored and curious and is put under much pressure to leave this safe haven. Okay. The soul afflicted by Asidia then will seek to escape in a couple of ways. Number one. They will seek out others to discuss matters, often under the guise of the spiritual. It leads to talkativeness, in other words. That's his first child. In the seminary, I noticed it especially after meals, wandering the halls, bothering those trying to study, for always a good reason, but really not so good after all. St. Gregory the Great taught, when the belly fills, the tongue is loosed. <laughs> Acedia loves to be involved in hospitality, loves to comfort the brethren. Acedia hates silence and loves noisy environments. In other words, it wants to be distracted. Seeking distractions. Number two, this vice drives us away from spiritual matters. By being busy, busy, busy about many things, we do all sorts of things, but not what we're supposed to be doing when we're supposed to be doing it. Especially prayers and studies. How easy it is to keep putting off that one thing or those things we know we need to do and have fun doing the things we like to do. Number three, it can cause a certain sleepiness. We can escape by napping. So a person is wide awake when they're doing the stuff they like, but the minute we start the rosary or our studies, they start yawning and the head starts nodding. Time to sleep. That's the sedia. Number four, it causes a certain curiosity about things, not willing to mortify the understanding, it starts looking into matters that it shouldn't. So on the one hand, the soul has an urge to discover and learn. But just as bodily hunger leads to gluttony, if it's not restrained, so does mental hunger become a vice, a vice of curiosity if it is not moderated. As a result of these things, a kind of instability and unrest sets in. And this can lead to the unrest of the whole family, not just the individual. I'm sure you have felt it. One person starts to become fidgety, all of a sudden they're all fidgeting. We should be warned, the devil loves to increase this vice in the cities of refuge and will more frequently and harshly try a person whom he sees taking flight from their assigned task. That's from the saints. His goal is to draw them out of their city or their caves, so they forget the reason for their being homeschooled. Or the reason for homeschooling altogether. What to do? Okay, we turn to St. Paul. St. Paul comes to our aid. He provides this advice in his letter to the Thessalonians. Here it is. It's in like four or five parts. Here we go. He says, make an effort to be quiet. Make an effort to be quiet. In other words, stay in your cave. This is the sphere of activity marked out for us by our duties of our state and life. Be not upset by various rumors and things going on in the world. We're preparing for heaven. Burn it into your minds and your hearts. We're preparing for heaven. First and foremost... We're preparing for a favorable judgment. I want my children and my family to meet the Savior, the judge. And I want them to have a favorable judgment. That's what I'm aiming at. All that is of this world will be burned. It will come to an end. 
prayer, spiritual reading, and constant application to the duties of study and chores slay this vice. And they earn heaven. They earn a crown. Listen to Pliny. He said, live as if you were to die tomorrow and study as if you were to live forever. Live as if you were to die tomorrow, but study as if you were to live forever. St. Paul instructs St. Timothy to attend to reading. So, first one, make an effort to be quiet. The world around us is noisy. We quiet down. Pursue your own affairs. St. Paul, pursue your own affairs. St. Paul says, we must not, well, he says, pursue your own affairs. We must not, out of curiosity, this is from the fathers, wish to inquire into or learn the deeds of others or that of the world. God will let us know what he wants us to know when the time comes. Strict obedience and exact observance of the rule, which is to follow the traditions handed down to us, slays this vice. So do we have a rule for our homeschool? Even a simple one. If you don't, you should get together and form a little rule. What's your schedule? You know, public schools, private schools, all schools have a schedule. We could have a little schedule. We could do the best we can to formulate something. A little rule has a schedule. Little rules. Sometimes it's really good to have your children propose the penal part of the rule. If this happens, then what should be the punishment? And they're eager. Oh, they should do this, this, and this. And then they say, okay, that's what you wanted. And then when it comes time for the punishment, they're going, oh, this is what you wanted for this. You see? They wake up and they realize they have to be responsible. Help them form the rule. Have a rule. Pursue your own affairs. Avoid curiosity. St. Paul, again, third part. Work with your own hands. Be not idle. Do what we're supposed to be doing when we're supposed to be doing it. God always gives a grace to such situations for us to avoid sin. That's why we say idleness is the devil's workshop. If we are concerned with our own affairs, our duties of our state in life, we will not be concerned about those of others. So we will pursue our own affairs and work with our own hands. St. Paul. Another one. Walk honorably for the sake of outsiders. We should recognize that we are on display before the whole world. And you know it. You're in the, in the store. People look at you. Try wearing a cassock all over. <laughs> if you're afraid to wear a dress in public or tired of it, just think of me. I wear my cassock everywhere. <laughs> it's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. No problem. Now, we are taking the high road. The path that goes up. Thus... What we do and what we say is important. How we dress is significant. Our home schools ought to be first and foremost schools of virtue and good character. St. John Cashin says, Never can a person go about honorably and certainly not among those who belong to the world if he is not content to cling to the restrictions of his own life. So when I present myself in a cassock publicly, if I'm not comfortable with what I stand for and my own rule, people will know. But if I am wearing this very comfortably and happily, I have found they don't challenge you and they approach you. They say, this man knows what he's about. Don't be afraid to live your own life the way it's supposed to be lived. Trust. Let God see you and they'll work with you these people in the world. So walk honorably for the sake of outsiders. You represent something special. Don't try to be like the world. Remember the sons of Seth? They're on the mountain. What went wrong? They tried to be like the world. They came down and that caused a flood. Finally, St. Paul. Desire nothing from anyone. 
Be not alarmed that you do not have all the gadgets that other people have. Do not long for the luxuries of the world. Do with less and be willing to be behind the Joneses and the public schools in creature comforts and gadgets and scientific equipment. Boy, they're producing scholars. Real good, smart people. Really? How come it's almost universal in all the universities? If you've been homeschooled, it's like a smooth road into these universities. They know. You're, you're better trained. They know it. Having all those things doesn't make for a devout life or a close-knit family. Many have noted how helpful it is to do with less. To need something and yet not be able to get it. That's not so bad. This keeps us humble and always looking up and working together to keep things going. If we have everything we need, we tend to fall apart. Be careful of expectations. If you have constant expectations and you want more and more and more, you desire all this stuff, you will be depressed before long because you won't have your expectations fulfilled. You want A, B, C, and you keep getting X, Y, Z. Ugh, I'm sick of it. Tired of this. Stop the desiring of the A, B, Cs. And work with what you've got. And God will help you. And you will be happy with less. And you will produce more. St. John Climacus adds that prayer, study, thought of death, and manual labor also bind this vice. Prayer, study, Remembering, I'm on a path to heaven. Judgment, the thought of death, and manual labor bind acedia. Homeschooling, then, is training for heaven. By following this excellent advice of the saints, we surely begin to break free of this vice. We grow in many virtues and become a witness and a model to be imitated, a credit to the church. It is true, sad to say, that many homeschooled children will go down the mountain... Yes, this is going to happen, and you've seen it. They will leave the cave. But keep this in mind, moms and dads. All that you did was to place in them wholesome and good memories. You worked with God under the umbrella to build up their memories. That when the time comes, God will shine a light on those memories, and they will remember the peace they had on the mountain. And they will want it back. And with God, with Christ, it's possible to go back. They will convert. You also may be thinking how hard this really is. What a tall order this is, Father. Yes, remaining in the cave is not easy. You are striving to form diamonds under extreme pressure. Constellations that shine in dark nights. Perhaps this saying of St. John of the Cross may be of help. He points out how God accomplishes more in cleansing and purging the people of their vices than He does in creating them from nothing. God has a big task in cleansing us from our sins. It would be easier for Him to make us anew from nothing. But He sticks at it with us and works with us. So keep striving with patience. That's imitating God. This is a labor of love. You are in good company. I have one piece of advice on how to make all this possible. In the visions given to St. Bernadette at Lourdes, at one point the river Gav started to rise up and make a den with diabolical dissonance. It's risen up again. We read in her biography, one, it says... On the way back to the Petit Foisse, Bernadette revealed how at a certain moment the apparition seemed different from before. Suddenly loud yells belched from the Gav had rent the sacred silence of Massabiel. They challenged cross, collided with one another like the clamor of a brawling crowd. One voice, more furious than the rest, dominated them all and roared out, Get out of here! Get out of here! Get out of your place! Bernadette guessed rightly that the threatening curse was by no means addressed merely to her humble self, but was an attack directly against the vision of light standing in the niche above the Eglantine. The vision merely glanced in the direction of the rushing stream. The single look of one of sovereign authority of Our Lady reduced the invisible mob to silence. 
the enemy of all good would not drive her from the grotto where she gave her audiences. That was her place and she took it and he had to leave. She and St. Bernadette kept to their place and millions and millions of souls have been healed, either physically or spiritually ever since. It's wonderful. So consecrate your families and your home school to Our Lady. She's the perfect image of the woman in the desert, that is the church. She crushes the devil underfoot. Renew this consecration every day. Wear your brown scapulars and she will help you crush this vice, acedia, underfoot. Pray to her before every task. Offer her every honor, every hour of your day and she will help you. She will help you. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.